And uh, there's, there's one particular uh, group I'd like to call out, our public utilities folks, Scott Ellis over there. I point them out because public works, public utilities, we partner in stuff all the time. We do stuff together, we do projects. It, it's almost like you do it so often, you almost forget that there were two different departments, but we're the same team. I just wanted to let you know that's important. These guys are our partners in what we do every day. And thanks, Tom and Scott. And thanks for bringing some of your toys. I appreciate it. Our agenda for the evening. And, uh, oh, <laughs> yes. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Mike Gladbach. I'm the Public Works Director. Thank you, Mayor. And the next introduction is Mayor Zoltansky. She's just going to give us a little welcome and, and uh, get us kicked off. That's my cue. Well, welcome everyone. Welcome to our Public Works headquarters. It's such a pleasure to be with you tonight. And I want to welcome our online participants. This is being broadcast as part of our city's town hall, monthly town hall uh, series. This is our fifth in a series. And if you want to see some riveting civics at work, uh, just check out our website. There's a whole gallery of town, past town halls. We started with public safety, and we've had our uh, fire department, our water department, and our parks department. And this is uh, month five, so this is pu Public Works, National Public Works Week. So we're so happy to be here. And thank you, Mike and your team. Thank you so much for readying all the wonderful equipment right on the way in. There's an incredible display of, uh, of equipment that takes to run our city. What is public works? You know, before I became involved in city uh, life and city leadership, I don't know that I could answer that question, but now I know what public works is. You know, when we think about first responders, usually we think about those in our city that wear a badge, but ask any police officer or firefighter, and they'll tell you that they can't get from point A to point B without great public works behind them. Public works clears our roads in the winter time, our snowplow drivers, they salt and our roads. They maintain our city streets. Uh, in the summertime, you'll see them moving um, through your neighborhoods, sealing and leveling neighborhood streets. The, they work in incredibly dangerous conditions with uh, incredibly powerful equipment. So these guys, they know what they're doing and they're skilled, they're trained, and they're dedicated to keeping our city safe. And one uh, program that Public Works is uh, central to is our bulk waste pickup. So these are the guys that uh, run the dump trucks, the front loaders, and take the all the green waste and the household waste out to the dump in Magna and run those trips dozens of times a day through bulk waste season, and that's in the spring and the fall. So they are really the first responders for the first responders, and I want to commend everyone from our traffic engineers and our planners our engineering team, our roads crews, plow drivers, public, uh, the bulk waste pickup teams. We couldn't run the city without you. I uh, call public works the central nervous system of our city. And I think that is a very apt description. So again, welcome to the town hall tonight. So nice to see everyone here. I'm Mayor Zoltansky and thank you for being here. And if you have questions about public works, you can call my office or call Mr. Gladbach if there's something in your neighborhood that needs attention that involves heavy equipment, chances are Mike's going to be involved. And if you are watching this online, I'd encourage you to come down, especially bring the kids. At 7 o'clock, there's going to be a beautiful tour of the equipment. Uh, it's pulling into the parking lot tonight. It's really exciting to see it all laid out. It's all spruced up and polished out there. So I can tell your guys put a lot of love into the presentation tonight. So thank you, Mike. Thank you for the kind words, Mayor. Again, the agenda, we'll do a quick overview. We've got the different division chiefs here. Unfortunately, Brittany Ward, our transportation engineer, isn't here tonight. She's in quarantine. But Ryan will be taking care of that. We'll do some Q&A. We'll do the poll. And then we'll move out to the displays and, if you wish, a tour of the facility or parts of the facility. First off, just to get prepared for the poll at the end, if you just go ahead and take care of this, just text Sandy, doesn't have to be capitals, to 22333. Three, three. 
public works vision and mission. It's really quite simple. We want to be recognized as a Utah leader in the delivery of public works services. And our mission is, of course, that to work with the other departments within the city to provide those exceptional services to the, to the community. Our values are very basic if you look at this. Listen and respond to the concerns of the citizens. Do the job right the first time. Treat people with dignity and respect. Create a positive workplace for the employees and the residents. Basics, very important. These are just a breakdown of uh, what Public Works does as a whole. Of course, everybody's got an administrative section. You've got to take care of policy, budget. Uh, it's actually those guys manage the waste collection, uh, the contract for that. Engineering, design and construct roads, more to follow. Transportation, looking at the road networks as a whole, designing those studies, lots of traffic studies, very popular. And signs, we have our own sign shop. Operations, Wayne Bachman will talk about maintenance of the roads and everything else that he does. And then fleet management. You'll, you'll hear from Dan talk about the fleet and all the different stuff that we have to take care of for the city. I want to tell you about two things coming to Sandy City in the next couple of years that are, that are going to impact pretty much everybody directly. And we're really excited about this. The first, the county's going to build a household hazardous waste facility right outside where those trucks are parked right now. And they want to be operational by a year and a half from now, summer of 2023. That is huge. To add to that, in 2024, we're, you know, we're a member city with Trans Jordan. They're going to build a waste transfer facility right behind it. So you're going to have a waste transfer facility in HHW right here in Sandy. No more trips out to the west side. That, that'll be done then. Talk about convenient. Cleaning out your garage on a weekend. You got all kinds of stuff in there, hazmat paint, or just lumber, you just bring it right down here. They'll take it all. They'll be open on the weekends. So this is going to be huge for the city. We're really excited about it. At this point, I want to turn over to engineering. Brian Kump, our city engineer, and he's going to talk a little bit about what engineering does for the city. Thank you, Mike. Excited to be here tonight, excited for this opportunity. I could talk for hours about engineering and public works, but my wife tells me not to, so I appreciate this time to just share a little bit of what we do here in Sandy City Public Works and the engineering division. I am a city engineer, so I oversee the engineering division, which has a lot of varied responsibilities. Uh, we're a department, a uh, total of 13 individuals, and amongst the 13 of us, we uh, oversee a lot of various aspects of city planning and design. One of the top priorities we have is private development review. Um, when cities are created or built out of green fields, primarily private developers are the one that build the city networks. All of our subdivisions at one point in time were built by a private developer who built our roads and our infrastructure for us and then dedicated that land to the city. That's generally how cities grow. Sandy is now mostly built out. A lot of our current development is now infill, but it's still very important as we work with these developers to tie their vision and their products into the existing street infrastructure, water line infrastructure, storm drain infrastructure. It takes a lot of work, a lot of coordination, and a lot of design effort to uh, make sure that what they're building works for them, but also works for the city as a whole, and that it's all integrated into a functional city environment. Uh, Dave Polson, you want to raise your hand? <laughs> he right there is our uh, uh, development technician, so he's the key point that we have to do our private development design and review, a very important piece of our design team here, or development team here. Uh, once we get those plans approved and they're ready to break around and construct, we do inspections. We've got two full-time inspectors on the public works side, and they're out there in the field day in and day out, winter, summer inspecting all construction sites in the city, whether they be private or public. They're looking to make sure that what gets put on the ground meets our standard specifications and meets the plan sets that were designed. Uh, it's uh, not only to say unfortunate, just part of the job that inevitably there becomes a grade break, a survey break, or just a mistake made in the field. And these guys are 
uh, the field guys to make changes as needed, to fix things as needed, to bring things to our attention. I call them my eyes and ears in the city. They see the problems in the field first and then correct it where they can and bring it back to the table if we need to do design revisions. Uh, city surveying. Uh, the city has a surveyor position. Um, city surveyor reviews all the subdivision plats, helps us design capital projects that the city's paying for and doing or using federal funds and doing. Uh, we actually have an opening for a city surveyor. So again, if you have your surveyor's license, you'd be interested in working with us. We're accepting applications. Road cap permits. When you've got a private developer or a utility company, uh, I'm gonna use Google Fiber as our example, uh, a third party provider of services that needs to utilize our roadway network. We'll permit them to cut the road and install their network. We don't own the Google Fiber. We don't own Rocky Mountain Power, Dominion Gas, but through road cut permits, they can install and maintain their infrastructure. And then we can inspect their work to make sure they put our roads back together in proper fashion. GIS, Geographical Information Systems. This is one of my favorite modern technology aspects of our department. This is something that really didn't exist 20 years ago, but with modern computers and technology is now integral what we do, it's invaluable. And GIS, for those who are unfamiliar, think of it as a visual database. Instead of an old school database where it's just hundreds of files and text documents and you know searching for the right uh, you know, whatever you're looking for document, we can now create a map and the map is the database. And so if I need a geological report on a specific address, I'll go to the map, I'll find the address, I'll open up my geological reports. And there it is located on the address in a visual geographic database. Uh, the amount of computing and types of analysis you can do with this technology is amazing. Just think of any two items you want to prepare, for example, waterways and street network. Overlay the two and suddenly you can see where all the bridges will need to be located just with those two overlays. Any type of data that you would want to compare can be done visually in GIS and analysis of those reports are made from that. So it's a it's really impressive and something that we use daily. We have a full-time individual whose full-time job is maintaining that database and creating maps out of it. Development review, talked a bit about that already, uh, but we do in-house project design and construction. We call that our capital project program. We fund capital projects in three different ways. One is using local dollars through city council. One is using money from the state legislature, generally through grants that or earmarks they give us and transportation bills. And then the other is using federal sources through a variety of federal programs and grants. All of the federal money is funneled locally through what we call Wasatch Front Regional Council. They're the local metropolitan planning organization. They receive the federal dollars and then they dole it out to the communities inside their MPO, metropolitan planning organization. So we have a very close working relationship with them to get Sandy City a fair share of those federal dollars and do the big projects that the city couldn't afford to build by itself. That segues into my next slide. Two large projects that Sandy City Public Works recently completed. Both of these were built using federal dollars through the WFRC program. You can see those dollar costs there. 10.8 million on 90 South and Monroe, 7.1 million on the 9270 realignment. Uh, the city partners with Lowe's to provide matching dollars, but of the bulk of it is coming from outside sources. Um, both very big, significant projects that will improve Sandy City in the long term. Uh, 90th Monroe will improve access to the freeway, improve access to those businesses, and acts as a gateway to future development in the stadium block. We also have that new through turn that was constructed on the south end. <laughs> 9270 is similar, realigning that road to tie into the stadium. We view that as our main connection between light rail and the stadium, and we've included a 10-foot sidewalk, 8-foot park strip. We want that to be an active transportation corridor where people have a good experience walking to and from the stadium to light rail, encourage transit use, and make it a more friendly pedestrian zone, which is one of the primary drivers to do this project to make that road connection to the signal creating a better pedestrian link and uh, reducing the need or desire to drive personal vehicles to the stadium. Coming up, we've still got projects on the horizon, always work to do no matter how much you get done in the past. 
A project that will be breaking ground on next year is 94 South 7th East. There's a new Dutch Brothers copy on that corner. We're going to widen the left turn lanes on the east and west lakes to be dual lefts. Once again, that's one of those federal projects being funded through WFRC. 90 South 7th West also needs widening. That's being prim primarily driven by the new development in Midvale. Just to the north here of this structure, uh, if you haven't seen it, if you go up there and look, Midvale's doing some very large intensive developments, a lot of commercial, a lot of townhomes, a lot of apartments. Based on their master plans and the speed at which they're building out that community, we're projecting our road here, Seventh West, is going to need some major widening, and then the signal to our south is going to need a lot of work. So because of that future demand that we can see from Midvale, we're prioritizing getting 90 South and Seventh West widened out. We've got two bridges that were built about 30 years ago. Um, the city annexed those bridges in 2014, so they're now our responsibility. Uh, they are failing prematurely, <coughs> so we're currently designing new structures and looking for dollars that we could use to reconstruct them. Um, that'll be a project that you'll see in the future. Okay. And then we do annual maintenance contracts, uh, lots of different types of those, mill and overlay, slurry seal, crack seal, tree trimming and removal. All of these are various ways that we maintain and keep our road network in good shape. We do <laughs> annual contracts for each of these uh, through the engineering division based on the amount of maintenance money we receive annually. So I am not Brittany Ward, but since she couldn't be here, <laughs> I will do my best to present her slides. I'm sure she's watching online, so I apologize for you if I mess this up too badly. I'll start by uh, having a video play that kind of goes through, introduces her on the video, and then also oh, yeah. mute the speakers. Oh, well, I'll play it off of mine. Off of this one, we'll be okay. Then go ahead and put play on the video. Or almost like why? I guess you No. Wait. So, what's really great about transportation engineering is the technologies that are out there and available. There's a lot of pieces to balance as far as vehicles go and how to serve them and help move them from points A to B. Our administration became interested in a signal synchronization project. Is it looked at this network or this pattern of signals in order to ensure that people's commutes are the most efficient possible. We started this project last year in 2019. Every signal within Sandy City was coordinated together to ensure that vehicles are mostly arriving upon a green light. More arrivals on green leads to savings in both fuel emissions and time. From this project, 1,008 hours are saved in driving time per day. We also reduced vehicle emissions by 670 tons per year. We saw 53 times the cost benefit. So for every dollar that we spent on this project, the public saw $53 saved. Citizens should be noticing now is that they are arriving on green lights more often. While leaving out of your neighborhood, you may wait at a red light for a while. Once you get on that coordinated roadway, you'll be hitting those green lights a lot more often. We receive a lot of phone calls from the public giving us tips. They can call in and tell me, you know, I'm hitting this red light all the time. Is there something that you can do to help? Or when I push the pedestrian button, the walk symbol is not coming on. We really, really appreciate those types of phone calls because our eyes and ears can't be everywhere. It helps our signal infrastructure to maintain the best possible service it needs to. My name is Brittany Ford, and I am the city transportation engineer for Sandy City. So yes, that was Brittany. In addition to signal coordination and timing, that's just one small aspect of all of the different things that she oversees here at the city for us. Um, traffic studies, she's always conducting traffic studies based on speed complaints or needs, and then also reviewing traffic studies based on future development proposals, impacts to our city infrastructure, and uh, 
ways to keep people moving and still accommodate growth in a way that makes sense. It also helps us identify future projects such as 90th South 7th West that we know we'll need to do widening on to accommodate future growth. Uh, that specifically is a project that she identified after reviewing Midvale's transportation plans and saying, whoa, they got a lot of traffic coming here. We need to act on this. And so that's what we're doing. Master plans. Uh, she, in the last three years, completed two very large master plan projects. The first one is the city transportation master plan. This is the overriding transportation plan that focuses on the vehicular traffic. We do that about every decade. She completed it in 21. So we've got a new one looking ahead to the next 10 years, and we'll be looking to redo that again in 2030. Always moving, adjusting it. It's a very liquid document because the city is always changing, and we're always reevaluating what demands are, what drivers are, uh, drivers of the traffic are, and just the needs that we have. In addition to the transportation plan, you have the active transportation plan. The difference in an active transportation plan is that it focuses on all the movements that are not vehicular. This is your bicycle routing, your pedestrian routing, your trails, your transit. Um, this is a relatively newer plan that the city has done. This was the first time we did it in 2020. And the goal of this is to better integrate into the city network active transportation, to make it a more walkable community, a more bike-friendly community, to integrate our transit networks and corridors and find ways to make the city a better place to just walk around in. Uh, it's something we really are focusing on and spending more dollars in the future to accommodate. Examples of this are the pedestrian bridge. We built over 13 feet connecting the library to the middle school, an active transportation project. Uh, a lot of trail work that has been done through canal corridors and pedestrian crossings. Um, you'll see a lot of these pedestrian crossings attached where light rail crosses major roadways. Those are active transportation corridors. And so um, bike lanes are another one. We're looking at what we can do, what we need to do, and ways to integrate the pedestrian and bicycle networks in the city. And that's the difference of those two plans. Uh, she looks at all the street development and design. This is working with those private developers whenever they come in with a project and need to integrate new street networks into the existing networks or widening existing roadways. What do we need to do uh, that makes sense? She also oversees all of our signals, as you saw in the video, uh, maintenance and operations, um, all of this striping you see in the city and all of the signs. Uh, the city's quite large, and when you start actually counting up the signs, we have thousands of them in the city. Every one of those thousands of signs is inventoried annually and replaced on a seven-year cycle. We have a full-time crew that does signs for the city, and Brittany reviews and adds new signs where needed, such as no parking, adjusting speed limit signs, um, and just general traffic signs you see out on the road. Stripage, striping. Uh, our goal is to repaint the entire city once a year. Uh, that's all your crosswalks, all of your school markings, all of your lane striping. Uh, we do our best some years uh, due to weather or labor. We can't complete the entire city, but that's the goal. Um, striping happens starting now and through usually August, September with the good weather. So if in February, March, you're starting to see this line stripe start to fade away, wear off, that's the end of their life cycle and we'll be hitting them in the summertime. So they're looking good going into the next winter. Um, she also handles a lot of the speed calming, traffic calming programs in the city. She takes a lot of the calls about requests about speed. Um, as you would expect, uh, a lot of interest in that. Uh, a lot of people call into her asking about specific measures for their particular roads for our subdivisions here in the city. <laughs> So she uh, does do traffic studies on all the roads as requested, looks at existing volumes and speeds within our neighborhoods, and then determines the best place for the city to target some of our traffic coming dollars. Uh, our preferred method of trying to help control traffic speeds is through the use of driver feedback boards. Those are those LED boards that when you're driving tell you how fast you're going in real time feedback. We found those to be very successful before and after studies that we have done show that when those are in place, we're seeing about a five mile an hour decrease in the average vehicle speed. So that tells us that the typical driver who might be doing 32 in a residential zone sees that board, recognizes they're going quicker than they should and drops their speed to no bounds, 25, 26. That is the goal. It's a really good active way to inform drivers of their speed without being heavy handed. 
Um, we do get a lot of requests for speed bumps in the city. It's not something we prefer. Um, they do have a lot of negative uh, impacts as well. Uh, they're bad for snow plows. They hurt emergency vehicle response times when there's multiples of them they have to cross. If you've ever pulled a truck and trailer or a moving van, they're extremely annoying to drive over and it's a very aggressive form of traffic calming. So for that reason, we prefer the driver feedback boards, which we feel give a better result with less negative impact to the city. Oops. All right. Um, signals. Just, just throw this out there. How many traffic signals do you think are in San City? Anyone want to hazard a guess? More than one. More than one. <laughs> We're not a rural city, that is for sure. 87. The city has 87 traffic signals in Sandy City. Approximately half of those are on state corridors. They're UDOT signals, owned and operated. State corridor would be 90th South, State Street, 7th East. The other half of the signals are Sandy City, so we pay for maintenance and operations of those, and we coordinate with UDOT on the timing of those. We're on the same timing network as UDOT, which is actually very rare for a metropolitan area. The Salt Lake Valley, Salt Lake County itself, is one of the few metropolitan areas that is on a single synchronized traffic system. Uh, other metropolitan areas look at that in envy because we are able to coordinate multiple jurisdictional signals in one network. So Brittany's part of the committee that meets with UDOT monthly, um, talking about signal needs and new signals going in. We've got two in Sandy, one's going in on 94 at about eight east. You might have seen the work going on out there right now. It's currently under construction. This is a new pedestrian signal. We call it a hawk signal. And this is part of our active transportation plan that I talked about earlier. It will provide a new pedestrian crossing along 94 to connect those two neighborhoods together. It will also be a trail crossing for a future trail that's not quite in place yet at that location that connects north-south through that whole Sandy Canal corridor. Another signal we'll be looking to build next year is on 94 South, 7th West, on the west side of the freeway in the industrial park. And then Little Cotton Canyon Road SDS, this is a major study that we'll be looking to do. That stands for Solutions Development Study. We want to know how to improve 94 South from Highland Drive to the mouth of Little Cotton Canyon. However, one of the major pieces to this puzzle will be the final decision made by UDOT on the Little Cotton Canyon EIS. They have delayed that EIS till next winter. So we're going to wait on our study for that decision to be made because we'll need that decision to input into our study to see some of the best results or best opportunities for us to improve traffic on 94 South. I believe that is what we have for both engineering and transportation. So I'll turn the time over to Blaine Botkin, our operations manager, and I'll let him describe what he and his team do. Thank you, Ryan. We appreciate the efforts of that division. They keep Sandy City moving and they provide such a vital um, role in, in keeping commerce moving in our city as well. My name is Blaine Mott, I'm the field operations uh, manager, commonly known as the streets department. So if you get in your car or go anywhere, you're gonna deal with roads and you're gonna be affected by, by my division. Um, I've got some of our job responsibilities and things here we'll run through, but. For the Public Works Department, the Streets Division has more personnel. We over we have over half of the personnel in that department. In in our division has more personnel than in that department. So so streets are very important to the city, and we want to make sure that that they're running as good as, as possible. Some of our job functions, the main one is street maintenance. Anytime there's a pothole or alligator cracking or a depression or something just doesn't feel right, you're going to call our department. It's going to get routed my division and we're going to look at that we're going to send out um, our supervisors and try to figure out what's going wrong what is the issue and how do we fix it we also as part of our pavement preservation we will do overlays we'll do crack seal treatments we do slurry seal as well um, our goal is to try to make the roads as smooth and nice as possible for the driving public we also do sidewalk replacement we have a concrete crew that that goes around and does hazardous concrete replacement. So if there's areas in your neighborhood that you've got concrete sections that elevationally 
are, are not matched and aligned, that creates a tripping hazard. And our group will go out and do that sidewalk replacement and remove those sidewalk squares um, to make that a smooth transition so we don't have tripping hazards. We also do street sweeping. Um, that's a vital function as well in conjunction with public utilities because everything goes down the drain and then eventually into the Jordan River and, and out to the Great Salt Lake. And we want our city clean and nice. So the residents are proud of that. So that's one of the functions we do as well with, with our crews. The next job function or responsibility is snow plowing. We have a 24 hour response. We don't um, farm out any of the services for snow plowing. We have our entire crew is on snow plow. We have a day crew and then a night crew that goes out. And we've got the 10 wheeler trucks. We've got some bobtails all the way down to a few F550s as well to keep our city um, safe when it does plow. Now plowing season typically starts the 1st of November and goes to the end of March or the 1st of April. So anytime there's a snowplow event, we gear up the trucks, we get ready, and we go out and we, we make those roads passable and safe for the residents. The next one is infrastructure, infrastructure inventory. We have an inventory system, and, and Ryan alluded to this a little bit about our GIS for, for each resident and each property in the entire city, that we will inventory the street, the sidewalk, curb and gutter, the drive approach, anything dealing with that infrastructure in the public right away we have an inventory of that so we know the condition of that and we know on a, a rotating basis what areas are dilapidated and are pretty rougher and need some work and what areas are in pretty good condition as well we also um, oversee park strips and, and help um, parks department with that for the park strips um, <laughs> the next job description is tree trimming we actually have a tree trimming crew on site we have a certified arborist and that's really important because You've got kind of your roadway um, network and you've got the canopy there and we want to make sure for high profile vehicles that for the right of way area that the trees are safe they've been trimmed up to our ordinances and there's no damage to any high profile vehicles or any delivery trucks or anything like that that the city would be liable for so we have a tree trimming service as well the next service is both waste collection and this is one that's really important to the residents we do it twice a year. We do it spring and fall. The spring, it takes us about 13 weeks to get through the entire city, all 20 areas. The fall, it takes us about 10 weeks. The springtime will start the beginning of March and go through about the end of May, 1st of June. The fall um, curbside pickup starts about mid-September and goes right before Thanksgiving. So um, that, that is a vital service for the residents to be able to gather their, their items and their stuff, bring it out to the street, and we have our crews come by and pick that up and keep the city um, clean and, and nice looking. The last operation, um, job responsibilities, field operations. Our department, like, like the mayor alluded to, we have the big trucks. We've got the, the 10 wheelers, we've got the front end loaders, the back hose, the street sweepers. So we have the equipment and the manpower to support the disaster. If, a few years ago, there was that tree event with high winds and, and we had trees knocked down that were blocking sidewalks, they were blocking right away. Um, roadway, and so we are support for the disasters. They would call us and we would marshal our forces and go out and clean that up. If there was any landslides or anything up on the east side and it was blocking Wasatch Boulevard or anything, they would contact us. We would go out there in conjunction with the utilities department and work on cleaning that up and making it safe and passable. Any type of city events as well, we support them. And then, um, like Mike alluded to, our kind of um, sibling, right? Not rivalry, but our sibling relationship is with public utilities, and we work with them closely on any type of water line breaks or anything in keeping the city moving and keeping it safe. So that's kind of in a nutshell what the streets department does. The guys work really hard. We appreciate all their efforts, and and they really take pride in what they do. So now I turn the time over to uh, Mr. Dan Yates. He's going to go over the clean stuff, Mayor. Um, so are listening. How to report a gray sidewalk or a pothole? What's the best way to get that directly to you, your city serve or whatever? Okay, that, no, that, that's an excellent question. If you see something in your neighborhood that there's some ponding in the curb and gutter, or you've got some elevated sidewalk or anything, feel free to call down to our office. Our, our secretaries can get that information. We've got an app, the C Click Fix, that you can get that information to us. Um, at the end, one of the slides, we have various social media networks and things that we can actually get the information to the right party and we can rectify that and work on that. So we definitely, there's various avenues to get that information to us so that we can put it on our list and get it replaced.
Thank you, Blaine. My name is Danny Yates. I'm the fleet manager for Sandy. Uh, the fleet group oversees all of Sandy's uh, fleet vehicles and equipment. We purchase, maintain, and dispose all of them. Uh, we have six full time fleet mechanics, uh, two part time couriers, one fleet uh, shop supervisor, and a fleet administrative assistant. Uh, we also do 24 hour, seven day a week uh, call out service for fire department police, employees who are working 24 hours a day. Sandy Fleet has 682 total pieces of equipment, uh, ranging from lawnmowers to uh, 10 wheelers, dump trucks, wheel loaders. Uh, you'll see some of that out front. 388 of those pieces of equipment are registered to operate on the road with 152 police cars, 28 dump trucks, 20 snow plows, 11 fire trucks, five ambulance, and we also oversee five drones. Um, currently this year, we've taken delivery of nine new vehicles to replace some of the aging um, Due to supply chain issues, we still are waiting on 17 vehicles. Uh, we hope to get those here within the next few months. And we're hoping to replace 37 pieces of equipment next year. Um, we also oversee a state-owned uh, fueling site. That fueling site dispensed 103,000 gallons of unleaded fuel and 88,000 gallons of diesel fuel in 2021. Uh, anybody using the state fuel system can use that site. Uh, anybody in Sandy can use that 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, there's currently two 10,000 gallon underground fuel tanks um, that will be upgraded to two 10,000 gallon self-contained fuel tanks this fall. Uh, and fleet, we also handle all the uh, vehicle and equipment accident damage and repairs. We coordinate repairs with outside vendors to get the vehicles fixed and we work with insurance companies for reimbursement on accidents that are involved. And that's fleet in a nutshell. I'll give it back to my kid. Thank you, Dan. Just a couple of quick comments. First, Dan's a little shy. I didn't tell you about his softball team. All the tools. The record isn't anything to brag about, but they like to have fun. <laughs> so, anyways, it's nice to have a softball team. I know there was a couple of comments I heard some talk about concrete. We've been moving forward quite nicely on concrete sidewalks, especially. Um, that was an issue that was brought to our attention a few years ago, and the council got behind it and uh, gave us some extra funding. We're really pleased. We, We've been banging away at that. We had we have what we call the short list, which actually had 300 items on it. About a third of them are gone. So we're moving along. And if we continue that funding level, we're going to make this uh, three week or three year wait to a two year wait to a one year wait. And that's substantial progress. And uh, so we're real proud of that. Another item that I know some people are wondering about. Google's out there in the streets. They're, and they're all another one that's, you know, as mentioned earlier, it's another utility. They're in the right of way, they're allowed to be there. And that's a good thing. They're going to provide a fantastic service. It's going to take them about a year and a half to wrap up the city. So, you know, even though you see them moving along, uh, there's a lot of roads out there and a lot of homes. You know, you're looking at 25,000 homes plus that they're trying to service. So be patient. They're moving along, they're getting areas closed out, and it takes a couple of weeks for some, depending on the damage that they've done uh, to restore it, but they will be there to restore it. And our inspectors, as mentioned earlier, will be there to make sure they do that. So help us out and don't be afraid to call us if you know a week or two's gone by and they didn't fix that piece of sidewalk or that piece of whatever, or there's a hole in your driveway that they, you know, whatever it is, let us know. Because we'll chase it down, make sure it gets done. Anyways, you've heard a lot about things that, that we do as far as all the tasks, the missions, and everything else. Let me tell you a real quick story about the people. And that's important to know. The team. About five years ago, it was January 2017, we had a fire down here. Some people might remember it. About half our complex burned out. And it was pretty devastating. We lost half our fleet. Bruce had to work all night putting the fire out, along with a whole bunch of other folks that were there. It was a big fire. 
It happened on Thursday night. So then it took till Friday to get it out. So we didn't do anything. We folks didn't come in until the following Monday. We had our first meeting as a department in the truck wash up on a hill. Why? Because it was the only building that still had heat. Don't forget it's January. So we had our first meeting in a heat truck wash. So we made a plan. The plan included talking to our neighbor cities, folks like West Jordan, Salt Lake County, UDOT, and borrowed equipment from those folks. So we could make up for what was in the ashes. Had that together in a week. Good thing, because about a week after we got the equipment down here, we had a snowstorm. So these same guys that didn't have a place to hang their hat yet were out there pushing snow. So that's by then about the middle of February. Well, it didn't stop from there because a couple of weeks after that, we had that windstorm that Blaine mentioned, knocked down a bunch of trees all up and down the city. So these guys went out there, cleared all that out, hauled it out to the landfill. Good thing, just in time, because walkways starts in March, early March. But they were able to start walkways collection on time, on schedule. Why? Because the guys are focused, they're dedicated. They're not just dedicated to the job, but they're dedicated to the people they serve. And I think that's very important. That to me is a team. That's what, that's what the people are all about. And at this point, I'd like to thank you. And then what's the next step? Ah, the poll. So I'm going to turn it over now to Paul. Our deputy. He's going to that's all we need to bring up. Well, good yeah. evening, everybody. My name is Paul Browning. I'm the Assistant Public Works Director. And I have the fun part of this evening's presentation, the interactive poll. Like Mike mentioned in the very beginning of the presentation, even on the screen right now, if you text on your cell phone the word Sandy, it doesn't need to be in caps, just Sandy to 22333. And you should get a message back that says you've joined the presentation. You don't need to click on anything, just text Sandy to 22333. You'll get a message back and you'll be uh, dialed in, ready to go for the presentation. So we'll let everybody go in there. Okay, so I'm assuming everybody at home is can participate in this as well, as well as here in the uh, in our room this evening. The first question is, have you ever contacted Public Works? Yes, text A, no, text B. And we'll see how many results we get before we move on. We've got 16 results so far. Probably a steady one right there. So 70, that's going up again. So I'll wait a moment. I'm not done. Mike told me how it works, so they won't call. So we'll get that as a That looks like a good number right there. So we have 21 votes in thus far. So 71 with the set of contact and public works. So, so far, so good. Go on to the next question. This is a multiple choice answer. You don't have to select just one, but if you have contacted Public Works, what was the issue? Was it A, snow removal, B, waste collection, C, traffic? Maybe something for Brittany Ward or transportation engineer. So go ahead and uh, vote for each one of them. If, if you can only text one letter at a time, so you can text A, then you have to text a B, depending on what you contacted the department for. It looks like about oh, it's up now. It's almost like election day. <laughs> the next slide will be voting. As you can see, as the results are coming in right now, it, as we find in our department, a lot of times it, things are seasonal. In the wintertime, you get uh, some potholes because of the, the pavement breaking up because of the cold weather, snow removal questions. When you get into the spring and summer months, uh, people are getting out of their homes. You see concrete issues being big issues, uh, bulk waste, uh, pavement, and things like that. So a lot of seasonal things right there. But as you see, you know, waste collection is a big one. It's amazing. I saw the office, uh, Monica and Rhonda take calls every day. And it seems like bulk waste and waste collection are, are big ones. And they do a fine job at responding to the citizens and getting the problems solved. 
And it looks like you're still getting a few more in there as well too. The sidewalk curb and gutter issues is coming in there. Looks like a second. And then traffic control issues like uh, Brian mentioned. I know Brittany's listening online right now. She takes care of a lot of those as well too. So looks like we're about done there at 58. You can see the breakdown accordingly. This next one's kind of interesting. You, you can only vote once, but the Sandy City is coming up with a new program, and everybody here this evening is going to be either in person or at home will have a chance to vote for the name of a snowplow. We're going to take this information, and the city's going to roll out citywide a, a program to uh, have residents come up with the names of uh, snowplows for, for Sandy City. And Dan Gates, our fleet manager, will make sure those decals get on the snowplow. So take a look at the names that are up there. If you like Gunter, uh, text A. If you like Snow Beast, B. Blizzard Buster, Snow King, Plowmasters E, Extra Salty F, The Colonel, G, Snow Big Deal, H, and even Hold the Ice, I. So we'll take a look at this. And like I said, the city's going to come out by the end of summer. We're going to have this new information coming out on our social pages, probably on the newsletter that talks about naming the plows. This is your first night, your first stab at taking and uh, getting those names out there. So we'll take this information, forward up to the administration and communications team and go from there. But right now it looks like it's pretty close. Blizzard Buster and Extra Salty. <clears throat> Just give it another minute or two, see if anybody else wants to vote. Looks like we're just about done here. Don't, don't see any real changes right there. But again, look forward to this. A lot of communities across the country have contests and have opportunities for groups to name the snowplows. And like I said, Sandy City wants to be part of that as well, too. Help kind of a bond with Lane's guys and the snow removal crew with our community as well, too. By someone can say, hey, I named that truck. Uh, it's no big deal. And there it is right in front of my house. Keeping your business. So see this information. We'll save it. And like I said, I'll forward it to our uh, communications team. Uh, Later on, so that's all I have on that. Mike, back to you. Thank you. Sorry, man, I'm just going to let the mayor say a few more words, please. Thank you. I hope everybody has learned a few things tonight. I know I have. Um, I just want to let you know, remind you, we are in budget season in Sandy at City Hall. On Tuesday nights, the city council is going over if every department's budget. And tomorrow night is actually the presentation for public works. Can anybody guess the budget on this department for the year? All the stuff. It's about $40 million just to manage our roads and streets and the traffic, all the, the uh, services that were discussed tonight, $40 million. So that's part of our $140 million budget that it takes to run the city. So these are your tax dollars. You as Sandy residents should be very confident that your tax dollars are managed wisely. And that's a big part of why we're doing these town halls is so that people can learn the value of the city services and how it impacts our everyday life in Sandy to keep our community safe. Um, I want to recognize, speaking of our city council, we have Scott Earl, council member Scott Earl in the back. And Council Member Marcy Houseman also in the back. I'm sure there are other council members online tonight, and I thank them all for their service, um, making sure that our city operations are running on a very tight, balanced budget is their job, and they do a great job at it. So if you want to participate in the budget discussions, you can tune in online on the Zoom link through the City Council page or attend in person at 515 on Tuesday nights. So this uh, we are in the Think of it right now, and we're going to be going line item by line item on fleet, on operations, on vehicle management. Uh, I want to share one, one aspect to public works that I was so impressed with. I, uh, When I was on the city council, I spent some time with the mechanics in the garage. Uh, before I was in public service, I just thought we sent our vehicles out to be repaired, just like you would your own. No, we've got our whole mechanics garage, and the uh, the People who work in the garage are experts on everything from lawnmowers to police cars and motorcycles. And of course, our big, big, big ticket uh, equipment like our fire engines that cost $1.5 million, our back trucks, which are $800,000, snow clouds, $750,000.
So there's a lot of money out in the yard that's sitting out in the yard tonight. You're going to see it up close. Very rare opportunity to see it up close. But we have the skilled personnel to maintain that, and they do so, so to save you and me money in our tax bill. One of the features that we used to just always change oil in every vehicle per the manufacturer's recommendations. Every 3,000 miles, change the oil. Now our mechanics pull the oil out of the vehicle, analyze it, put it through um, our own analyst uh, machine downstairs in the garage. They can tell whether it's running clean, whether there's metals present, whether there's um, chemicals present that signal there's big mechanical failures on the horizon whether it's premature to change it, even though the manufacturer's specs say that it's time to change it. So they can see if they're changing that each vehicle is tracked, the oil maintenance is tracked. So that savings, that creates money savings, that means our tax dollars are managed wisely. It saves us as a city $50,000 a year just to analyze our own oil and all the vehicles before changing the oil. So Things like that, these are improvements that have come to light because of the people who work in the departments, the people who have the knowledge and the skill, the expertise to say, we could be doing it better. We could be making improvements as we go along year to year to save our residents money. So that's happening right here. This is the epicenter of the public works fire that Mike described. This beautiful building, the administrative building um, has been uh, obviously built and it's Still has that new car smell, I think, here coming in tonight. And it's very, it's a beautiful showplace and a great work environment that inspires the people who maintain our, our safety issues to come to work and think about our safety and improvements all throughout the city. Phase two is on the horizon. That is a big capital improvement project, and the city council will be taking that up. Uh, that is the garage and the storage for our expensive vehicle uh, that uh, we now store outside or under partial shelter. So I'm going to ask Mike to talk a little bit about the phase two public works planning and uh, take any questions that you might have here before we do the fun part, which is the outside tour. Thank you. Thank you. Real quick, as, as the mayor commented, the, this is phase one and, uh, you know, we, we're happy to be in this, in this facility. Um, what's really important, though, because a bunch of us are still engineers, I'm an engineer. This building is designed for 50 years because we know it's going to be a municipal facility. It's going to be a long time to you readdress your facilities. So you build it right the first time. And if you look at it, it's not real glamorous. Tile, carpet, floors, everything else is polished concrete. The structure is steel and concrete. There's no wood. That's how you get it for the last 50 years. It's just that simple. Like I said, it's not glamorous. I mean, we put paint on, on sheetrock and we have a nice facility that we're comfortable with. Changing rooms downstairs, everything else. Very, 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 very I think you have. But that was phase one. Phase two is basically the rest of the complex, namely the facilities maintenance and equipment storage. So we have uh, drawings if you're interested in seeing that. What's interesting to see now is the stuff that's in place, it's a little bit older. Um, the, uh, the maintenance facility is pushing 50 years. So, you know, it's at the end of it. It's just a steel building. And if you'd like to see that, I've got Dan Yates, our fleet manager. You just heard him a few minutes ago. And he will take you down there and show you around. And we can take you elsewhere on the grounds, but we do want to keep you kind of close because it is still a working facility. And between that and the equipment on display, uh, which we're very proud of, uh, you know, those are some things you can do when we leave the room. In the meantime, if you have some questions for me, I, I'd love to address them. This is one of those rare moments where you've got all the division chiefs in one room and it's not a staff meeting. And so we can answer those questions. Got the engineers, got the streets, guys, got the, the, the maintenance guys, all those folks are here. So if you have some questions for us, we'd be glad to. Steve. How do you determine it's time to replace the street? You need to do that's a good question. The same as that, like, yes. Dan, can you? Uh, <laughs> we, we use a uh, fleet maintenance or fleet tracking software called RTA. It stands for Ron Turley and Associates. Um, I think Ron Turley, he started his career at the UPS or FedEx. I don't know, but he 
pretty much revolutionized that company's uh, free program. And so they have a scoring system on there that takes the age, the mileage, and the maintenance costs all into consideration and uh, the, the, the complexity of the vehicle as well. Um, street, the street sweeper being a little bit more complex than a um, F-150 pickup. So we can uh, we, we pull a report once a year and based that report will give us a score on that vehicle. And the higher the score, the uh, the worst off. The worst off that vehicle is, yeah, we, we probably need to replace that vehicle. High score so, wins. I'm sorry. High score wins. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's a complex uh, formula that it takes all that cost into consideration, and um, so when they score really high, then we start looking at replacing. And and it's very simple. It's numbered one to twenty-five. And uh, there's even colors. I mean, it's what is it? 21 and above is red. Yeah. And then yellow and green. So, you know, that way, you know, the rest of us can look at it and go, oh, I get it. And, you know, he's a smart guy, and the rest of us got to look at it and try to interpret it real quickly on the fly and we can do that. Next you know, when they salvage or surplus them, they recoup some money on the back end to sell it to the second yeah. mark, secondary market. Yeah, close to auction. Old, always goes to auction. Yeah. And that money gets cycled out. This has to do with both ways to pick up. But as I drive around, I have a lot of neighbors who put stuff out on the both ways to pick up that could go in the blue garbage can. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me that if we were all intelligent residents use the blue garbage can appropriately, we could significantly cut the number of weeks we need to spend on both ways to pick up. So what would your employees do with that extra time if we would shorten the whole way pickup? That's a great question. They do what they really like to do, and that's put asphalt down, concrete, and trim trees. Those are the you know three big things for the guys in the streets division when they're doing that. And of course, when they're out there busy doing all that, they're working that equipment hard. So that's got fleet maintenance working hard to keep them on the road. It's a good thing. So that keeps it through a little domino effect there. But <clears throat> they like to do that. I mean, that's what they signed up for. Um, they're, they're good with ball plays. They're fine. And, and that would be nice to make it you know, a little more efficient. That would be wonderful. Um, but that's what the guys would do. I think if the public understood that, they yeah. can cooperate more to be more efficient with the use of our. That be something we add into the, into the education plan. Education plan. Okay. Had a lot of changes with our yeah. golf waste pickup this year, and our communications team has done an excellent job from um, pile size to pile location and placement. So, for the big changes that we've been, been seeing this year, we've seen a great compliance, and people definitely are making an extra effort to understand the new rules and to abide by them. So, it's a process. It's Every time we're going to work planning on continuing those education efforts, and every time we do the bulk waste, getting a little bit better and better. I say more stuff in a garbage can. You have a a dumpage or what do you call it? Tilt feet, right? For done out of the waste in the landfill, correct? Yeah. But that's somebody else's vehicle that's taking take all that maintenance <laughs> and wear and tear for that tonnage. So that would be if people were putting that in garbage cans instead of, you know, yeah. So that's another way to yeah. save yeah. save some money for us. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Sir. I want this garbage spot. If there is too much weight in the can, the arm can't quite get it over. Uh, <laughs> you're right. I've seen that. You're absolutely right. Um, and when that happens, it's yeah, that's not a good day for that driver. <laughs> Any other questions? If not, one online question. Oh, is there an online question? Yeah, Ray was in the middle of answering it. Um, okay, they said your team does a great job. I'm curious about the evaluation process used to select contract and products used by the city. Last summer, my neighborhood had a slurry. Uh, seal placed on the roads, but already seems quite worn out with cracks. 
that have reopened, is that just the nature of the beast or how do you determine whether expenditures are really effective? Well, the, the ones that apply, you know, it, it's a bid system and it's a low bid system. That, that's how most government work is done is through low bid. Now you have to still have to be qualified to do the work and all those people that submit bids for the work are qualified for the work. Um, their interpretation of what's wrong with the road, I, I don't know. I mean, we'd have to take a look at that. You know, do you, do you, does something happen every now and then? When you do a lot of slurry, you put down a million dollars for the slurry, is a little bit of it not gonna stick like it ought to? Yes, that's possible. Because there could be, there could be other damage to that roadway that you may not see right away. There could be other material there that's just gonna cause it to delaminate or something like that. Or maybe it went down on an area where we crack sealed. We always try to crack seal before we slurry. And maybe we didn't crack seal it as well as we should have. And so you'll have some exposed cracks where moisture goes in and out. There's so many things that can happen. Um, generally speaking, we're pretty happy with our, our slurry work. But on occasion, you might get areas that may not survive as well as they ought to. I don't know. Is that? So um, just to add on to that, uh, the, the performance is done by bid, but the material itself has to meet a minimum city specification. So all of our asphalt, all of our slurry, all of our crack seal has to meet a minimum product specification, and we tell the contractor what to buy in place. And then our inspectors are watching that product to go down to make sure it meets our specifications. With slurry, it is a less durable product. That is true. It's oil and usually a sand gravel mix, and it's more a wearable surface to kind of rejuvenate and refresh the road. It's not structural. It, uh, to really um, fix is the wrong word, but to really create a new surface, you have to do a mill and overlay. But the cost is significantly more than a slurry. With our limited budgets, we can cover substantially on the order of 10 times more roadway with a slurry than we can through a mill and overlay. So we do a lot of slurry uh, to give that road a new surface to rejuvenate the oils, uh, but there will be some reflective cracking that comes through. And if the resident doesn't mind just dropping in the street they're wondering about, I'd be happy to have my inspector go out and look and just see if it's a standard issue or if this one did come through thinner than we would like. Can you talk about the pace, how often we surface and how we maintain our roads? Yeah, so... Um, for crack seal and slurry seal, we're on a seven year cycle. Um, crack seal is the ribbon, the, the, a lot of people call it tar. It's not really a tar, um, it's a polymer. Uh, and so we put that down in the cracks on year one of the cycle, or if it's a brand new road, let's say year seven of the cycle. And the following year, year eight of the cycle, we come back and do a slurry. And on all of our residential and less traveled streets, we can do that three or four times, which gives you 21 or 28 years of road life without having to mill and overlay that surface, just by continuing to do it crack and slurry, crack and slurry. Now on our heavier traveled roads, roads that have a lot of truck traffic or a lot of daily traffic, such as 13 Beast, uh, they wear out much quicker. Uh, those roads are built thicker. They have more road base. They have more asphalt to start with. But even at that, they'll break down faster. So because of that, even though 13th East was built in 2009, we are beginning a mill and overlay project starting on the north end of the city this year to create a whole new driving surface with two inches of fresh asphalt, which is a significantly more substantial project in story. Or paint the city. Question about uh, asphalt loads versus concrete roads. Cost by the cycle of the police. Concrete versus uh, asphalt roads. Both have significant pros and cons. Uh, our, our city chief administrative officer, Cliff, asked me that question. I think it's loaded. <laughs> um, Asphalt is considered a flexible pavement. Concrete is considered a rigid pavement. What that means is asphalt is uh, more forgiving than concrete. Uh, asphalt has room to expand. It's easier to place. It's less expensive usually than concrete. Um, but with oil prices right now, it's actually starting to be about 50-50. 
Uh, it's easier to cut into and to do uh, utility lines. It's easier to patch uh, and repair. Which is easier? Oh, asphalt. Asphalt, sorry. Concrete is very expensive to place in general environments, and it's very time consuming. You have to wait for the concrete to cure. Uh, but being a rigid pavement, it almost acts as a bridge. So if you have extremely poor soils, like we do closer to the freeway and down here along the river bottom, it doesn't have the tendency to start to move on you. Uh, if you have the soft soils underneath, asphalt will start to break away sooner with a bad soil base because it's moving with that soft soil, whereas a concrete road is rigid and is, you know, helps support itself so it doesn't bend as much. We have a lot of concrete roads around City Hall. They've been there a long time. They're in great shape, but they're very expensive to replace when we need to do a new sewer line, for example, which happened about eight years ago. Uh, anytime a new project goes in, they got to replace a full panel instead of just a single cut. But we're not slurry, cracked, or overlaying those roads. They last a very long time. So if there's no clear answer, it's more of a do you want a road that's easy to get in and out of and a road that in general is less expensive to build up front? Or do you want to spend the time and money up front on the concrete, which might give you a longer life and less maintenance down the road? But if there's a problem, it's a big problem. Yes. Take it from me. Yes. <laughs> I hate to dig it in concrete. It's a pain. Okay, any more on mine? That's it. All right. At this point, I'd like to, I think we'd like to just move forward and, and offer up the tour. Oh, yeah, on the way out, don't forget, there's cookies and water in the back. And, yep, we have some public works coins and there's some other uh, information sheets and everything in the back. Uh, uh, basically, back for you. So, you can use back for you. probably a shot kind of back there. So, help yourself with any of those items that you wish. And then, if you're interested in taking a look around, especially at the fleet facility, fleet maintenance facility, we got Dan here, and he'll just meet you right up front and take you on over there. And if you want to just go over and take a look at the equipment, you go right back out the way you came in through our front door and uh, just turn left, and you'll see all the equipment. You just walk around the fence. The gate's up. There's even a giant arrow board there saying equipment demo. So you can't miss it. So thank you all for coming tonight. We enjoyed it. I hope you did. I hope you learned something. Yeah. Okay. So we will continue the, the live stream to the, to outside for those who would like to continue. Are you going to just carry this?